Welcome to the Deep Tech Nation Forum, the platform for interviews with key people of the Swiss technology ecosystem. Listen in and get to know their personal stories, experience and vision for the Switzerland of tomorrow. Welcome to the interview of Francisco Fernandez. Uh, we are in Zug. Hello, Francisco, in your family office. And it's a uh, perfect timing. Uh, you, you just sold your company last year for 2.3 billion uh, to NEC, the company Avaloc, uh, leading uh, bank and software company. And so I'm extremely privileged to talk to you because you are one of the most successful entrepreneurs in Switzerland. And um, so we'll be talking first about the past, where you come from, what has been your entrepreneurial journey and the future. The most ex exciting, I mean, I may say that you, you, you've made more than half a billion out of the exit. So where will you spend the money? What will you do? What are your aspirations, your vision? Uh, what kind of impact do you want to have on, on society and the world in general? So I'm delighted. And let's get started from the very beginning. Can you tell us more about uh, you? Where do you come from? Uh, and uh, what did you do before you started uh, a business? So first of all, thank you for being here. I'm delighted to get uh, uh, a chance to speak to you and uh, deep, deep dive into some important questions. And thank you for the flowers. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so let's, let's go. So from the beginning, you said, uh, where is the beginning? I would like to start with my parents. I'm uh, a son of uh, Spanish immigrants that immigrated roughly 65 years ago. Uh, and they made uh, a very good choice, namely coming to Switzerland and not anywhere else. Uh, and uh, therefore, I got the privilege to, you know, to grow up in this beautiful country uh, with a very uh, good framework in many senses, education, you know, healthcare, proper processes, and uh, very nice culture. And I had the great privilege to study in the best universities, some of the best universities in the world. Uh, for example, my studies at the ETH Zürich, uh, which had a great impact of who I am and what I am today. I'm a, a proud father of two girls and a 23 year old uh, ballerina, mm -hmm. which uh, is in Russia right now and the eight year old uh, baby girl. Great. So, uh, when did you start your entrepreneurial journey and why? Mm, actually, directly after my studies, I made master degrees in uh, software engineering and economics. Uh, I landed at the bank mm -hmm. and uh, I got to see how the bank was working internally mm -hmm. and coming, you know, from a university where you are, let's say, 15 years ahead of the reality in the economies, I, uh, I was shocked. Um, and uh, as I said before, uh, as an entrepreneur, I'm a very curious person and I want to understand what's going on around me. And once in a while I fall in love with a problem. And the problems I saw at the bank is the tremendous inefficiency of how bank processes were done mm -hmm. and the poor use of technology at that time. And I wanted to change this because these inefficiencies, uh, I was aware that this is being paid by you and me because we are all bank customers. Right. So I wanted to change the status quo and therefore I started writing software for banks. But then how do you create Avalog? So I had also luck to meet uh, uh, my mentor, mm -hmm. which was the owner and CEO of the bank um, uh, at that time was Martin Ebner. And um, after complaining about my boss, he gave us a chance to roughly take over the enterprise in very early days, mm -hmm. two years after I started my, started my career at the bank um, in 89. Right. Uh, and he said, yeah, if you think you can do better, you put your money where your mouth is and you can take over 30% of the company. Uh, the company at that time was, uh, almost nothing, five people, mm. one customer, <laughs> no assets. Mm. So it was actually investing in a shell right. and in one customer, which was almost nothing. But what that triggered uh, in me 
uh, was, you know, had no price. This was uh, the start of my entrepreneurial career. Mm -hmm. And how, how did he uh, go from, uh, let's say, uh, how many people at the moment, at the, at the beginning, were you when you started, but let's say five, five people to a uh, 2.3 billion uh, co dollar company, what have been the main uh, stages of development? How, how quick did you get to, to uh, growth? Um, you know, very often this is not linear, but rather exponential. So right. at the, the beginnings are always hard right. for every startup. Even today, everything is more accelerated, but, you know, the start is always um, uh, slow. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you have a successful product, uh, you know, successful, uh, you know, go to market and the customer base suddenly, you know, the effect kicks in and, and, and you have accelerated growth. But, um, you know, it's not easy to go from five people to two and a half thousand. Um, roughly, you have to reinvent your company every four or five years. Uh, I was impressed. I was making a, a study visit in, in the U.S. at the um, Stanford University. And the professor of economics asked the audience, what do you think is the lifespan of the Fortune 500? Then everybody was thinking of General Electric, the Nestle's, etc. And some people said 50, 60 years. The truth is 12 and a half. Um, so to get to a company that survived 30 years is already quite an achievement. That means you have to change the company, the status quo, the product portfolio, the attitude, and everything. You have to reinvent every couple of years if you want to survive and continue, have continuous growth. So the, the, the stage is... Uh, I would say at the beginning, the most important phase was to create a product mm -hmm. that solves a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first problem we tackled is, can we make banks more efficient mm -hmm. and more accurate in terms of, you know, accuracy of information and automation? And we had to write that software. Right. So uh, to write Avalog version 1.0 mm -hmm. uh, was, was the first major achievement. And we, this was probably also the hardest period in our careers. I remember that we worked for three years, day and night. Mm. We were um, working until two o'clock in the morning. We went to the bar opposite the building in Staufacher, and we continued by writing architectures and stuff on the white napkins of the table in the restaurant. We put the pizza aside and mm. went on designing. And we had uh, for two, three years, zero vacations. Zero, I mean zero. 16 hours work per day and you know out of the seven to ten engineers that worked on that um, I think half of them they f went sick or lost friends or uh, uh, what about uh, you did you uh, enjoy that, that so, so that it's, it's very or <coughs> yeah of or course not. of course you enjoy it because it's when you make it and at the end you have a software and we ended that project by replacing all the systems of Bank Oppenheim at that time. Mm -hmm. And from one day to another, you switch off their running operative systems mm -hmm. and you switch on yours and the bank can operate. Mm -hmm. This is, of course, extremely remunerating. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, running a, math a marathon and then you cross the finishing line. Uh, this is adrenaline and endorphin and yeah. pure luck. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't hold for long and then you say, okay, where's the next problem? And that's how you develop uh, uh, constantly. So after having the first product, first version done, mm -hmm. running operative, um, you say, okay, fine, we did it. This is once in a lifetime thing, or that's at least how you feel. Uh, and we, know, we knew that to, to write such a comprehensive banking solution takes 1,500 men years of work. We had 20 mm -hmm. to build the version 1.0. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a big achievement said it can't stop here. It's actually a start. Mm -hmm. uh, so the world needs that. If it's good for this bank, could it be good for all the other banks? Actually, that's how I started. If I wouldn't have known that there's a market for that, right. I wouldn't even have started. So mm. I, I knew that the problem that we were seeing was there everywhere right. because I started with an evaluation for the bank 
looking at different um, uh, banking systems in all over Europe, right. and there was no decent system. Right. Therefore, we said we have to write one. If it doesn't exist, there's a market. Everybody needs it. Nobody has it. Let's do it. So the next phase was then, you know, how to push that into the market. Right. Uh, let the market know that there's, you know, an innovative solution there. Mm -hmm. And then you need to grow. And then you need to grow sales, maintenance, installations, implementations. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a certain growth phase. And uh, we ended up being quite successful uh, in sales. I remember after... Um, Delivering that to the first bank, um, I made a list of 64 banks I wanted to sell to. Mm -hmm. And I hoped that, you know, two or three might buy it. And we ended up having seven signatures. Mm -hmm. And we had the capacity for two. So uh, we needed to be creative how to deliver that now. And, um, and when you so. started in 1995, if I can recall. So when did you have this problem? 1998, uh, we brought the first bank life on the new right. system. And then, and then you need to scale to be able to deliver, uh, uh, to, to fulfill the demand. Uh, how long did it take you to get the first 10 customers? Uh, the first seven were signing in the first six months, mm -hmm. six months to 12 months, mm -hmm. which and was extraordinary because yeah. the mm -hmm. sales cycle of such things yeah. is usually above yeah. a year, That's a year fast. to two. Mm -hmm. So that was quite fast, and I was surprised that we had such a, respond, mm -hmm. a response. And then, you know, you suddenly find yourself being number one in Switzerland, mm -hmm. and then you say, okay, uh, is that... I knew it was a European problem at least, yes. um, so we wondered if it was not a worldwide problem, and our customers, the multinational customers like Barclays and other T1 banks uh, told us, hey, uh, it's fantastic how we can operate here in Switzerland, can you do the same for us in Luxembourg, in the UK, in Singapore and elsewhere? And that's how we started and planned then the uh, going international of, of Avalok, which was again a, a different dimension of complexity and of, of uh, growth. And at the end of this international process, how was split the uh, customer base and the employee base, uh, Switzerland versus the rest of the world? Yeah, we ended up um, having 23 subsidiaries mm -hmm. in Avalok worldwide, internationally, mm -hmm. serving to an international clientele, mm -hmm. um, local banks in different countries or, or multinationals that uh, wanted to roll out our platform mm -hmm. uh, all over the place. And then uh, another phase was when the big financial crisis hit us, mm -hmm. you know, 2009, 2010. I had to lay off for the first time um, uh, people and, you know, employees were for me not just employees or not just human resource. I didn't look at it as a resource. These were friends, hand-selected, hand-picked mm -hmm. talents. Yes. Uh, I, I developed uh, also for, for years mm -hmm. uh, and this was a very painful moment, but also a lesson to be learned um, how to do that in a decent, good way. Mm -hmm. So I remember that we made a town hall and we appointed the managers, we made them uh, uh, responsible to find jobs for the people they lay off. Mm -hmm. When I presented that concept, how we want to do that layoff, right. uh, that cost reduction, uh, I almost had tears in my eyes because the employee base were applauding. Right. I said, I, I just conveyed a message that I will lay off hundreds of you and they get applause. How can that be? So it was a, it was a very touching moment, a big lesson learned. And, and we did that uh, uh, in the course afterwards. And at the end, we, we tried to place every employee somewhere in our customer base, right. etc. At the end, we had more demand for our talents than we had people to lay off. Right. So, so right. Nobody, mm. uh, uh, nobody was jobless after, uh, after that reorganization. And... In the aftermath, we quadrupled Avalok. So we took the crisis as a chance and right. said, okay, let's sit together, find the next strategic moves. How can we react to the crisis? And I like the Chinese expression of crisis. They have two symbols right. of, of the world crisis. And one symbol means um, a crisis or problem, and one means chance in one word. Right. 
So, and that's what we, what we did. We tried to see the opportunity in the crisis and we quadrupled Avalok. We quadrupled the number of employees, we quadrupled the revenues, we quadrupled the number of customers. So we did the best out of the crisis. And if you look at uh, those last 25 years, what would be a mistake you are now uh, looking back saying, I, I, I would do it differently? Uh, what do you regret? Which regret do you have? Um, actually, not much. Um, so I would have done an IPO much earlier mm. or, or an, not an exit. Right. right now, I didn't, for me, an exit in, 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 in that trade sale. Actually, I think uh, Avalok would have deserved Uh, also to do an IPO, but um, I would do that much earlier because to get access to the capital markets uh, is is um, a big leverage or a big opportunity you have to grow your company right. easier. It's much harder to do everything self-financed. Mm. And we self-financed Avalog for, for 25 years. Mm. Uh, so on one hand, you have the benefits of If you have everything under control, mm -hmm. because you're self-financed, you can develop the company strategically. Mm -hmm. You can innovate, uh, you can allocate the funds the best way possible uh, without you know, having the capital markets dictating you that the next two quarters are more, expo uh, more important than the next five years. Yes. So there are mm -hmm. you know, pros and cons for both, but probably today I would go to the capital markets. Mm -hmm. So if, if you... I mean, some of the uh, listeners uh, today uh, will be software makers from Sutton and startups. Uh, so what, do you, uh, what kind of piece of advice would you give them being a Swiss software developer? Uh, market positioning, is it a chance compared to be a, an American software company or a, a weakness? What, what type of advice would you give to the Uh, current young Swiss uh, entrepreneurs in the software space, uh, in particular in banking industry? Mm -hmm. So I think there is no such thing anymore like a Swiss company, mm -hmm. especially not in software. Mm -hmm. I think today the world has become flat mm -hmm. again through the internet. So the nice thing about software it is it is endlessly scalable right. if you do it right. Um, because the planet is flat. The internet travels everywhere. Information and bits and bytes travel in light speed everywhere. Mm. And that's how you have to think also for yourself. Um, you are a Swiss guy, you know, you have some roots and some tradition, but I feel as world citizen. Mm. I can travel around virtually or physically And I can interconnect with people of different cultures. And that's, I think, important if you want to create um, larger companies or world leadership in, in any segment. So I think the best thing for a Swiss is not think Swiss, but think global. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that means also to interconnect not only computers, but interconnect people. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of startup or ventures They might be headquartered in Switzerland, and I like that because then I can spend more time here, and I like the Zurich Lake, and I like the uh, Swiss you know, ecosystem or whatever, the Swiss framework for headquarters, but I think globally. Right. And when you start a company, immediately we have you know, a subsidiary of collaboration colleagues uh, in the Silicon Valley, in Israel, in Singapore, in India, in Sweden, in Helsinki, wherever you find the talents. Right. In the software space, you have to follow the talents. Mm. As much as you follow the customers, because the customers are everywhere through the internet, right. you rather follow the talents. Mm. So, so interconnect with people. Distributed organization yeah. and, and yeah. very global thinking. Yes, yes. That means also intercultural mm. thinking. You know? yeah. I don't feel as the first thing Swiss or Spanish, mm. you know, I'm a human. And I want to interconnect and, uh, you know, mm. deal with whatever culture you mm. come up with, being open. Mm. Great. Um, we're moving gently into the second part of, of the discussion. Uh, based on your experience, um, what are the next steps for you? Uh, as, as I mentioned before, you, you've had a very nice cash exit. You also are still very active 
uh, not just uh, business-wise, but I see also culturally. I you know, can't show you, but we saw a big piano in, in your office. So um, why is this piano for actually? What, <laughs> what are you playing yeah. and, and what do you play? So, so first of all, piano has accompanied me since I'm a six-year-old right. uh, child. So I'm a musician as much as I am a mathematician or a software guy mm -hmm. or a businessman or a family man. So it is a very important pillar throughout my life. Actually, when I was 18, I was dreaming of a music musician career. Uh, my parents couldn't afford it to send me to Berkeley to study jazz. So uh, I went to the ATL to study maths. And, uh, but I never gave up on the music. Right. And I still play almost every day. Uh, so I have my pianos everywhere. I have a piano in Mallorca in my uh, home there. I have a piano at my mom. I have a piano at my office. I have a piano at home in Volerau. So I have everywhere my pianos. And a week without the piano is lost as a lost week. Uh, but you know, that, that's another part of, of me. I can, I can relax through high concentration. You can imagine if you improvise, um, you know, jazz or whatever, your brain is working at 100%. Right. Uh, and exactly that usage of the brain forces the brain to not be able to think of other stuff. Yeah. So that's how you can disconnect from the other stuff mm -hmm. and live in another, uh, in, an, in another world. So that was important for me for whatever recreation, free up, mm -hmm. um, you know, some, and what are some, your favorite? Some, some bad thoughts, etc. <laughs> so that's that's my. And know, what kind of music do you play? What are your favorite uh, pieces? I, I al almost like every music. Last week uh, we invited a couple of flamenco musicians and dancers in Spain. Mm -hmm. It was a fantastic experience. I had three, 13 years of of, of classical piano education. You know, playing Bach, Schubert, Beethoven, Mo uh, Mozart, and mm -hmm. Chopin. I still. Love Chopin mm -hmm. and other big classical music uh, composers. And then I had for four years of rock music, and then we ended up into uh, reggae when that was fashionable. Mm -hmm. I went into jazz and, and then ended up in Latin jazz, jazz, because of the freedom and the complexity of, of, of that music. So if you were to make a bridge between entrepreneurship and music, or jazz in particular, uh, what would you see for uh, patterns uh, and similar similarities? Now, now, the, the nice thing is that uh, some of the best music you can play is not solo, but in an orchestra or even in a band. And the interconnection, the immediate interconnection and dialogue that you have in the, uh, with these musicians, mm -hmm. can imagine improvise, mm -hmm. invent and innovate mm -hmm. as you do. With a group of people, <laughs> this needs a connection mm -hmm. that is incredible mm -hmm. and on the spot. So, so, so that interconnection with humans, that interaction, that fast thinkers dialogues uh, is, is, is very intense. And together you achieve more as a right. team than what you could do alone mm -hmm. because you have just two hands, um, uh, you know, and, 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 and a band or an orchestra can do, mm -hmm. can do m much more. Um, right. So coming back to your first question, what's now next? Right. Um, so I see the trade sale of Avalok uh, not as an ending point of anything, mm -hmm. because for me, every ending point is the starting point of something else. Right. And the journey is more important than the goal. Um, so it's like a sports guy. The end of the marathon is the start of the next marathon. Right. So you, you don't give up on that. Um, it's also important to know that it was the second company I exited. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't like the word exit because exit seems like an end. Right. For me, it's a natural transition of Avalok into the next phase. It had four or five phases with me. Mm -hmm. It will have some phases after me. Hopefully after I die, it will still have its phases. Uh, and uh, I'm still in the board of Avalok, so right. Avalok will always be connected with me and I will always be connected with Avalok. I mean, it's my baby. It's, yes. it's like having a daughter and she gets mm. out of home mm. and marries. She's still there and you will still there, yeah. be there for her forever. Mm -hmm. This is how I feel about Avalok. Uh, and I'm still um, you know, active as a, as a board member, not anymore in the same role I had before, but 
still have a role uh, there as long as I'm, I can contribute or as right. long as I'm wanted there, I will be there for them. Um, and it's the second company. I also um, I had an exit with a company which was called Adkubum, which was uh, also a fintech company that, for the insurance space, not for the banks. Right. Um, and it was, was the second one. And when I um, opened up the cap table of Avalog bringing Warby Pincus on board and Raiffeisen Group on board, I already started with that money creating uh, new ventures or you know, investing or buying myself into new ventures or founded a couple of companies. Mm -hmm. And I have today a dozen of companies um, I'm Which you heavily, in, heavily invested um, or, or even control. Mm -hmm. So I always try to have a substantial stake because I'm not an investor, I'm an entrepreneur. I right. only invest my money in my own ventures and then I engage myself with all I have, network, brain, time, money, whatever. I dedicate myself to these, um, to these ventures or to these companies and this is my mm -hmm. risk management, if you, if you wish so. Mm -hmm. uh, so an investor just gives the money to somebody and say, okay, please do a good job. Uh, I take care of my money uh, by, by doing the job. Because, so, because the passion is actually not the investment, but the job. <laughs> job too, yeah. yeah. And so what, what kind of problems do you uh, try to solve with your current companies? What kind of investment space do you have? I cannot mention all the 12, but uh, some, some I can tell you. So one is Utopia Music, uh, and uh, we made a, a, a tremendous software being able to um, analyze music consumption. And uh, we are sniffing or crawling all music consumption on the planet. Right. And we have probably one of the largest music consumption databases in the world. Right. So we can tell you who is um, uh, listening what, where mm -hmm. on this planet now. Mm -hmm. And um, then we put some artificial intelligence up to, on, on top of that. And we found out that the world is paying a third of what they should be paying as music royalties. You know, there are composers right. and yes. uh, record labels and there are third, artists, yeah. they produce music mm, I know. and some others stream music or put it in the air. So you have radio, you have TV, you have the Spotify's of this world, mm -hmm. but also social media, you put the video, you put some music under your video, this is called sync. Right. And um, two thirds are not being paid right That's now. Amazing. It's mm. all manual, it's very outdated, mm. very poorly optimized, right. very error prone, mm. a huge lack of data, right. and therefore only a third gets paid. So the music industry actually deserves to mm -hmm. earn three times what they are earning today. Right. It's a big problem, yeah. and I love music. Mm. And yeah, so we should, we should change this. Mm. Uh, another topic is we do something similar because I always build business platforms based on strong software platforms. Mm -hmm. So it's always software underneath. So therefore you might say, hey, he's in music, he's in finance, he's in food, he's in real estate, he's in cars, but you know, the common ground is always software platforms. So we build a software platform, also big data based uh, also on, on artificial intelligence for the pharmaceutical medtech industry. Mm -hmm. And we were reading millions and millions of scientific papers clinical studies, patient data, cancer sequencing data, whatever. And we are able to predict the success of a drug in a clin clinical study. We found even drugs that we know that will be not successful mm -hmm. for the indication they are supposed to be, but they would be much more successful for something completely different. Mm, very interesting. And the guys don't know that. right? But we have the data mm. telling us that because we are not looking in a tunnel, but we look at the whole planet's data, right. all clinical studies, all proteins, molecules, mm. diseases, patient data, hospital data, yeah. everything, right. and interconnect that in a big ontology. Mm. So the base is like a Google right. for pharma, mm. uh, which is much more targeted and gives you much better results. And then AI on top of it to to do some, you know, predictions and things like that. Like the Google so, for music. And, and, and for me, the most important is the purpose. Why does a company exist? French, quelle est la raison d'être? So why does Avalok exist? Because we want to make banks more efficient. Why do, or, uh, why do we do the music industry? To 
help the musicians producing and keeping, uh, you know, the pace of, of, of creating beautiful music and getting paid uh, decently so that they have an incentive to continue. Why do you, um, why do we do this pharma thing? Because we want to heal people with an other angle while, while big pharma is looking at the problem through the uh, uh, eyes of chemistry and biology, yeah. we look at it through the angle of data. Yeah. Complete different outcome, different options. Uh, so we can have a big contribution to this, to solving this problem of healing people uh, with a complete different approach. Uh, so it has also always to have a, a new uniqueness that not everybody can copy you, but you bring in a novelty, yeah. an innovation into the problem space uh, you want to you want to solve. Another thing is making certain asset classes accessible to normal people. Mm. Make an example: real estate. Mm. Um, an apartment house, fully rented out in Switzerland, mm. can have an average return of six and a half percent. Right. Plus the value growth another five percent. Mm. So with an apartment house, you can of twenty million, you can make 12, 13 percent return. Right. But this is only accessible for rich people and institutionals. Mm -hmm. Normal people on the street can never participate in that because they don't have the 25 million to, to buy an apartment house. Right. So it's easy. You buy the house or you, you know, take the, you reserve the house, you make 10,000 fractions and you, you sell the token mm -hmm. for 50,000. Almost everybody can pay 50,000 and have the same profits than the rich. So you democratize an asset class that was only restricted to the region's institutionals. The same, ha same happens with art, the same happened with high-end cars, uh, the same happens with other asset classes. So we can make, you know, in, on this planet we have 450 trillion worldwide wealth. 200 trillion, which is a large portion of it, you know, let's say 40% is unbankable assets. Unbankable more or less means it is reserved for the rich, and for the institutional. Why? We can structure that in a new way that is it accessible, tradable, viable for everybody. So, so you're talking about the blockchain and uh, crypto uh, in general. So I'm sure you've been very uh, much thinking about it from a very early point of time. So can you tell us what's your vision about uh, cryptocurrency and the blockchain development and all, all the other decentralized finance topic? which are the moment are coming on the market, is it, uh, you know, what kind of future do you see for mm -hmm. these technologies? So first of all, I'm not only thinking about stuff, I'm mm -hmm. doing stuff. I'm, sh so. I bet you, I'm <laughs> sure you are. That's why I'm asking so, the question. So I started my um, uh, blockchain journey 10 years ago mm -hmm. out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, I read the paper of Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, I think in 2010, yes. one year after it came out. I downloaded that stuff and I wanted to understand. So I downloaded that stuff on my PC and started mining. It was possible to mine on your normal desktop. Of course, today <laughs> it is not possible anymore. You need a huge, gigantic machinery. Uh, but that time it, it was, at that time it was possible. So out of curiosity, I wanted to understand what's that new stuff coming out. And since we were a fintech, and the first yeah. use case of blockchain was the currency, which is, you know, digital money. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, I need to learn about this. Right. So I tried that stuff out, mined a couple of Bitcoins, never sold, by the way. Mm -hmm. I only bought later on additional, yeah, well uh, ad additional uh, uh, currencies or coins. And I thought it was a brilliant invention. So first of all, um, the innovation of having blockchains is, I think, thousands of years old. I don't know if you ever heard of the island Yap. No. They invented Yap stones, mm -hmm. Hinkelsteine, and oh. they, they said this is now the means of payments. Right. And there was a consensus algorithm that mm -hmm. if somebody got such a stone mm -hmm. and became wealthy, yes. they were telling the families and these families telling it to the next families until the whole island, right. it was 600 people, agreed, ah, oh, he has a stone, yes. he's rich now. Yes. <laughs> so this was the first consensus protocol. So there are early yeah. concepts it's of true. decentralized mm -hmm. protocols and finance um, uh, uh, thousands of years ago, and also decentralized databases, mechanisms in, in, in uh, academic literature, you can read already 20 years about, mm -hmm. about it. 
but what Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever that is, we don't know if it's a consortium or a, or a single person or a student or whatever, he did three genius things. So first of all, he selected a fantastic concept uh, of blockchain, hmm? mm -hmm. what they call blockchain nowadays. It's a fantastic concept, beautiful concept. Uh, secondly, he said, I don't own it. I give it to the world. Mm -hmm. Let it go viral, mm -hmm. open source. Uh, and the third thing is he stayed anonymous. Mm -hmm. If that guy would not be anonymous, if that guy would be known, yeah. he would be dead or in jail <laughs> or nailed on the cross, believe me. So yeah. the, the combination right. of these three things, yeah. you, know, I, you know what happened to big disruptors or innovators. Yeah, you absolutely. know, when Copernicus said the world is not flat, it's round, mm -hmm. they would have liked to burn him on the next uh, or nail him on the next cross. Mm -hmm. You know, the uh, Napster, who, which was the first music download, it was declared as illegal. Mm. Uber, Bitcoin is in many cases illegal just because it, you know, it, it potentially disrupts and destroys powerful institutions yeah. and everybody's against it. So humans are not really change mm. uh, or they are mainly change averse and want to be protect the status quo, especially if you're in a powerful mm -hmm. position. Right. Uh, so, so to stay anonymous was, I think, a very important right. pillar of that innovation. Mm -hmm. You see what happened to Ed, Ed Snowden and guys yeah, like this. You absolutely. Know? So you find yourself in jail or dead. Yeah. So um, having said that, um, this beautiful technology um, creating the use case of a currency was just mm -hmm. one killer use case, but you know as good as me that there are tons of use cases, mm -hmm. what you could do with uh, this distributed ledger or distributed uh, a database with consensus. Mm -hmm. um, so I use that technology in different senses. Mm -hmm. We are using that technology, for example, in Inoterra, where we produce sustainable food, mm -hmm. sustainably produced healthy food for the planet. We already produce 500 tons of food per day. Mm -hmm. And uh, one important thing is if you have a sustainable way of producing food, um, vegetables, fruits, etc., we want to make that traceable. Right. Uh, that the world knows, aha, this is a good liter of milk from a healthy cow, from a, a, a farmer in India that has a decent life. Um, and you can now track back the liter of milk down to the cow. Right. We have even face recognition for cows. We know this is Emma. Emma is healthy. Uh, he produces 12 liters of milk. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can trace that. And the blockchain is, you know, immutable, secure mm -hmm. way, for example, to track uh, uh, goods. This is also another example. Uh, we launch with uh, the Partex group, mm -hmm. where we are in oncology and other mm -hmm. uh, medtech fields, we are issuing now an OncoCoin. Right. A patient who joins the platform mm -hmm. will get an app mm -hmm. uh, which help him potentially survive, mm -hmm. participate in clinical studies, get medicine cheaper, get second opinion, mm -hmm. connect to his cancer twin, to a person on the planet that has a similar situation as him with similar, let's say, uh, uh, tumor DNA sequencing, uh, etc., and as incentive to join the platform, we will give him some onco coins, mm. and he can sell the coins, he can inherit the coins, he can buy medicine cheaper with the coins, he can uh, uh, buy a second opinion from a top specialist that he could not afford with our coins. Mm. So it's another use of of of, of these type of coins, or I will tokenize classic cars. You know, if a car or a, or a piece of art like a Picasso costs 150 million, you cannot afford it, you can buy a fraction of it right. and profit uh, uh, from, you know, from, from, so try to protect the, mm. the picture to survive through the, your investment, but also participate in the performance of this piece of art with your coin. And you can make it a liquid, um, a liquid asset class, which didn't exist before, affordable and accessible for everybody that has mm. an iPhone, a, a phone, a mobile phone. That's fascinating. Uh, uh, fast tracking, let's say five to ten years ahead, because you are a visionary and a doer at the same time. What, what do you think will? We'll, how, how would you describe the decentralized uh, finance world in in 
five to 10 years time? How, how, yeah. how disruptive can that be? Yeah. You know, we started with a use case called the digital currency. Hmm? So we, this tries to be an alternative mm -hmm. to fiat money. Right. And it was not a coincidence that it came out 2009 as an answer to the biggest financial crisis in the world we produced. Right. We destroyed $55 trillion of wealth right. uh, in a very short time. Mm -hmm. And the politicians and central bankers um, rescued by printing money. Yeah. So I think printing money is very risky mm -hmm. and somebody will pay the bill, which mm -hmm. is the citizen, mm -hmm. normal people. And the worst thing about it is they promised this was a crisis of the century. This will not happen for another 100 years. Mm. 10 years later, we have COVID, mm. and it became a habit to print money. Mm. And if you have an economy and you double the money supply, mm. your cash is half the value as before. Right. So it's a hidden tax or depropriation, mm. and people got aware of that, and they said, let's come up with an alternative mm. where we have no alchemists being able to produce yes. gold or to print money. Mm. So it's another governance model how to govern money mm -hmm. in a democratized way. Right. Uh, this was the first use case. Now we have coins, we can, you know, mm -hmm. we can have digital assets, not just digital currencies right. and, 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 and different use of that. Mm -hmm. Now, one is to have the asset, mm -hmm. the coins or the tokens or the currencies or other type right. of assets, NFTs now with art or music or whatever, uh, which is also just another digital asset. The right. question is, how do you manage that asset? Mm -hmm. The fiat assets are managed through the banking system. Mm -hmm. You have central banks, you have clearing houses, you have depositories, you have messaging services like SWIFT and all that stuff. Right. And this industry has become big, fat, potentially not efficient anymore. Mm. Capital allocation worldwide is potentially not efficient anymore because you have machine trading, you have uh, the ones who have get more, the ones who need and are, are, are better probably don't get it. So the capital allocation worldwide is, in my view, not, in, not efficient anymore. Right. And now with this new technology, a new financial market architecture is rising, mm. slowly but steady. and it will be an exponential process. This is my view. Mm -hmm. So now you can neglect to say, yeah, Bitcoin, it's, 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 it's only 2 trillion. Mm -hmm. hmm? Well, it's already 2 trillion. Out of the it 400 will, trillion you, know, you talked about, how much yeah. do you think? Uh, no, so, so hundred... I want just to say that that incumbent system mm -hmm. works with palaces at the Bahnhof, uh, at Amparadeplatz, mm -hmm. and you have to pay all these mm -hmm. buildings and all these bankers and all these bonuses and all that stuff mm. and decentralized finance works almost humanless mm. it's all machine based and decentralized mm. there's no central authority mm. there's no central control mm. so there's no central power and as we know big powers sooner or later they are being misused mm. no matter where you think of imperium romanum or the deutsche reich or whatever mm. big power sooner or later gets misused a decentralized system doesn't have a central power. So this is a huge, huge, huge fundamental change. Mm -hmm. Now, it can survive, it cannot survive, it can be better. I don't judge yet, but I say right. it's a fundamental change. Mm -hmm. and that change is only growing at double or triple digit growth. Yeah. It is attracting tons of capital. Mm -hmm. It is efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has the potential, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball, but it has the potential to completely disrupt financial architecture, financial markets, how they look today. Mm. And it's not gonna be binary, nothing happens and then it's there. No, it's happening now. Mm. And you can see it and you can watch it. Mm. And you can neglect it if you want, but you're not gonna stop it, I think, so quickly. Mm. I mean, Bitcoin is there since 10 years. Mm. It's not yesterday, it's not a startup anymore. It's two trillion, it's the size of Apple. Mm. So I would take that serious. Mm. Absolutely fascinating. Um, that's, that's just great. And, and let, let me just uh, 
finish our discussion with a bit more uh, focus on Switzerland. So you've been very involved, uh, obviously, the last decades. You, you, you're investing a lot of money in Swiss startups. Um, so what do you think Switzerland needs to do to move to the next level of scaling? Uh, to become, um, like Silicon Valley, to become a, a very strong hub for innovation in the digital space and uh, technology in general? What, what are the missing bits and what, what are the positives uh, you would like to emphasize? Mm. So it's a little bit more your vision of what Switzerland should do over the next 10 years and where, how would you allocate your resources, uh, well, most important points. Yeah. So I think the Swiss framework is not bad at all. Uh, it is small, sometimes smallness is good, sometimes it's bad. But if you want to create an enterprise in Switzerland, right. you can. Right. I'm an example, sure. <laughs> not the only one. Good one. And I'm always uh, astonished about the density of innovation mm -hmm. and hidden world champions mm -hmm. that grew and still are in Switzerland or, or still headquartered in Switzerland. I'm not talking only about the the, the Nestle's and Credit Suisse's of this world, but also, you know, hidden champions, um, uh, you know, that are not so much known. Straumann and, 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 and very successful cases that started here in Switzerland. So you can do it, mm -hmm. uh, but the framework and uh, the framework is good of you know quality of living, a extremely good education. And the average education is probably the highest in the world. Um, we are, we know the base democracy. Mm. What is, what has base democracy have to do with entrepreneurship? We have to vote for everything every other week. Mm. That means you are forced and educated to have an opinion. Mm. And you discuss that with the family in the evenings and at lunchtime. And I've seen cultures where the boss says, please do this, and then he said, yes, sir. Mm. In Switzerland, you say, you do this, and he said, why? Mm. You know, mm. so you want to understand, you want to be persuaded and not obliged or, or receive orders mm. and un not question it. We right. are trained to question everything. Yeah. And entrepreneurship is about questioning the status quo mm. and then change it. Mm. So that fundamental value system of questioning everything is inherent in the Swiss culture. Mm. Then the discipline, you know, to, to be accurate, to walk the talk, uh, to, you know, execute with discipline is also, uh, uh, I think, in the, in the value system. But then you have also regulatory, um, uh, the regulatory side of it. You have also quite a flexible um, working environment, or let's say work law. Um, if you look at France, uh, you know, it's much harder to mm. hire, fire and develop talent in France compared to Switzerland. Um, also the tax regime with cantons competing with each other is efficient, much more efficient mm -hmm. than uh, just saying, okay, you deliver 60% uh, taxes. So from January to August, you work for the government. Mm. I think the government does most of the things worse than the private mm. economies. There are only very, very few things that are being done better by governments. Right. So when you think of education, I don't know, the best universities in the world are in the US or private. Mm. So I'm not sure whether universities need to be government owned, if that is naturally better. So you can question how much etatism and how many, how much the, the quota of, of, of the state should be. Right. I'm a friend to keep that as low as possible, not as high as possible, and leave the rest to the market forces and competition and the competitive tension is always good to, to be successful. You see that in sports. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, so from, you know, tax, education, um, security, quality of living, even the climate, you have, we have real, real four seasons. Mm -hmm. Uh, is nice about Switzerland. What is uh, a little bit of a drawback is is the risk aversity of Swiss people mm -hmm. when it comes to hiring, uh, when it comes to allocate capital. Mm -hmm. You know, 
a failure in Switzerland. You do it once and then you don't get a job, you don't get money. In the US, it's a must, otherwise you're not a real true entrepreneur if you never struggled, <laughs> you know? Uh, so failure culture, um, uh, risk culture, we have a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. Also the ecosystem of, you know, early money, VC capital, private equity mm -hmm. is kindergarten mm -hmm. here in Switzerland. And that's very sad because we have one of the highest R&D highest education, highest innovation yeah. rate, highest innovation rankings, but the US does the money with it. Mm. So you create the thing here, mm. and then you need growth capital, the growth capital, to get growth capital, you have to go to London or to the US. Mm. So you end up in the US, mm. you know? Urs Hölzle, one of the co-founders of Google, where did he end up? He ended up in the US. Mm. It's a pity. We could do that in Switzerland, but you know, yeah. capital allocation and and and, and Risk capital is nowhere here in Europe in general, even more so in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. The role of banks, you know, mm -hmm. helping entrepreneurs to finance with debt, etc. That culture is disappearing, mm -hmm. you know. Every risk officer and compliance officer, don't touch it, it's risky. Mm -hmm. And then they lose it with some other mistakes, you know. Uh, so I think we could improve that ecosystem of capital allocation much more. And then the rest is interconnect, you know. Um, I think Switzerland, not being in the EU, stays small. So it, the bilateral way could be intelligent, you know. We are a niche player. Mm -hmm. So if you find a niche role for a niche player, you can be successful. You know, it's more than about agility and, you know, bilateral good deals. So I'm... I don't say not, uh, uh, necessarily that size is the, the king's way. Mm -hmm. um, I think also beautiful can be, a uh, uh, small can be beautiful. Today the fast eats the, eats the slow and not anymore the big eats the small. Right. It, it, it's more about agility, intelligent, intelligence and interconnection. Right. So I think Switzerland needs to interconnect with the world, mm -hmm. you know, so not only with Europe. And which niches do you think are, are predestinated to be successful in Switzerland? So yeah, everything, speak. you know, we have extremely costly labor. Right. So we could not produce t-shirts in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. No way, economically not viable. Mm -hmm. When it comes to brain work, mm -hmm. highest education, high sophistication, complex tasks, mm -hmm. complex innovative tasks, um, uh, Switzerland can play a role. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, watches, very complex, you know, uh, micromechanics, um, artificial intelligence, chemistry, biology, everything, artificial intelligence, everything w which is high sophistication, high complexity, high education mm -hmm. needs, uh, uh, especially digital, we could be fantastic. And there's a reason why Google uh, opened up the uh, second largest research center outside uh, the US in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why NVIDIA comes here. There's mm -hmm. a reason why IBM Research Lab getting uh, Nobel Prizes are in Zurich. You, you know, so where you need high sophistication talent, um, uh, Switzerland can be a winner. And just to conclude on, on, on the human touch, who has been the most influential person in your life uh, and, and uh, particularly if you've met this person and somebody who's given you uh, the interest to uh, get started your own business, but somebody who might influence you uh, for the next few years. Uh, so who would you quote or at least can you tell us a story around meeting this person? Yeah, there are a couple of people that I still have in mind after decades. Um, one is when I finished my studies, I was not so sure what type of work I should do because studying computer science uh, in, in, in early 90s, you could choose. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did not apply at companies, companies would apply with us, you know? You've got a pile of letters every week, so you could choose. And sometimes if you have too much choice, you, <laughs> you need help right. to make the right decision. So I went to a Berufsberater, I did say that in, in English. Uh, advisor? A consul consultant. consultant and uh, advisor. And he said, whatever you do, Fernandez, is not 
so important, um, just have two things in mind. Um, you should not choose a company, you should use a person to work for. That person has to inspire you. Intelligent, it's new, new to me. The second thing he said, only sales brings money, everything else costs money. If you want to be successful in the career, once in your career, you have to be in sales. Because I don't like to be in sales only. This is not complex enough for me. I said, if you become an entrepreneur, sales is at least a part of your business. <laughs> you know, and the entrepreneur to has to be a salesman as well. Yeah. So, so, the, so that person is still yeah. in my mind. I just That's met him one hour in my life, in my early, yeah. uh, late 20s. Still, still there. Very interesting. Uh, second one I, I mentioned already, Martin Ebner. Mm -hmm. uh, I became uh, the, the trigger to become an entrepreneur came from him. Oh, he was an entrepreneur. He was the owner of the bank, mm -hmm. and he taught me uh, important things like you know you have to love your customers. Mm -hmm. Very simple, mm -hmm. very hard to implement in real world. Mm -hmm. You have to love your customers. You have to understand your customers mm -hmm. even more than you understand the product. Mm -hmm. First, it starts with your needs, mm -hmm. and you know. La raison d'être for a company is its customers. You fulfill the need of your customer. So put that in the true center of your thinking. Right. Many have that claim on their website, but they are not right. um, uh, 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 customer centric. They are product centric or whatever centric, bonus centric or whatever. <laughs> uh, so so uh, my mom is very important in my life and my father as well. Mm. So the piano is because of my father. Mm. I would. As a child, you don't get to the idea to buy a piano and start to learn piano. Piano gets very hard after four or five years. Mm. Most give up. I didn't give up because of my father. He said, you have to. Mm. And today I'm endlessly grateful mm. that I have that. And that, right. Fascinating. So I'm absolutely delighted having spent uh, an hour almost uh, together. Already. And um, <laughs> it, was, it was just great. And I thank you very much. Wish you well for the next chapter of your life. And hopefully we can do some business together. You keep on okay. investing in new startups. So do we at Swiss yes. Ventures. So thank you very much and um, uh, wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you and the team for being here. Great. Thank you. In the Swiss Ventures Deep Tech Nation Forum, we talk to some of Switzerland's most influential people in the high tech sector. Together, we are shaping Switzerland's future.